Hi, everyone. My name is Barry McEwen. I'm the president of the Pluto Naturalists Association. I want to welcome all of you to our October program meeting. Just a few brief announcements. Um, as before, the pandemic has made a few changes for us, but uh, we're doing our field trips uh, with usually 15 people uh, that have been uh, had their vaccinations. We like to have you make a reservation with the uh, field trip leader. Our, uh, obviously, we're having a Zoom program meeting as you're participating in right now. And next month, we'll have our uh, second Zoom banquet uh, in our annual meeting. And we will also, after the uh, program that night, we'll go into our annual meeting and people will also vote on the uh, officers for next year and our uh, constitutional bylaws update. I want to thank John Dwyer, and Ellen uh, Leonard, Chris Manzi, Kim Smith, Jim Witter, and others for keeping our various communication formats updated and getting newsletters out to you, Facebook things, uh, current, and, we, and our website. We really appreciate that. Uh, as always, we encourage you to check the newsletter and the website for information on upcoming field trips and programs. And uh, although it's still fairly early in the uh, fall, uh, we'll be getting information out later on the December and January Christmas bird counts. So uh, our next upcoming field trip is in November. It's the full moon owl walk at Maumee Bay State Park. And again, check the website for the current time and uh, location for that. Our upcoming program will be November 18th, and that will be our Zoom banquet. And the program will be Shorebird Behavior, presented by Brian Weibel. And then we'll have the annual meeting following that. So I think uh, that's all I have for tonight. I'm going to uh, ask John to turn things over to Kim Smith. Thank you all for being here. Okay, can you all hear me, I hope. And I think our speaker is going to show up on the screen in just a moment. So I'm going to introduce um, Jay Wright. He's going to give us a program about blue jays and how they're changing the composition of Ohio's forests. So I think it's gonna be really interesting. Um, oh, there's Jay, hi Jay. <laughs> okay, let me introduce him to you. Um, Jay is currently a PhD candidate and a presidential fellow at Ohio State University studying the relationship between birds and nut-bearing trees in Southeast Ohio. Originally from Rhode Island, Jay first began wildlife work as a marine fisheries observer in the North Atlantic, where two chance encounters with rare black-browed albatrosses rekindled his dormant interest in birds. He went on to work as a seasonal wildlife technician for numerous research projects, including shorebird nesting in Alaska, endangered seabird monitoring in Hawaii, and leopard seal foraging ecology in Antarctica before landing in Ohio for graduate school. Prior to his PhD work, he received his master's degree at Ohio State, studying the migration ecology of declining rusty blackbirds at McGee Marsh and Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. He's also been involved with whippoorwill research at Oak Openings, so has grown to love the unique natural areas surrounding Toledo. So um, as usual, everyone, we have the audience muted and we're going to ask you to use the chat window to um, type questions that you want Jay to answer at the end and he'll take care of you then. So um, Jay, thank you so much for being here tonight. And if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, yep, that, that sounds good. Thanks, Kim, for the introduction. Sure. Um, all right, let's share a screen. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you all can see this. I think you can. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about some of my PhD work that I've been doing here at Ohio State. Um, so this is mainly on blue jays and oaks and their seed dispersal mutualism, uh, which I'll be talking about. And um, I want to acknowledge my advisors and co-authors, uh, Drs. Chris Tonro, Steve Matthews, and Leela Pinchot, who have been involved in all of this research as well. Come on. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about oak trees. Um, this audience probably already kind of knows or appreciates oak trees and their ecological importance, but I just wanna highlight a couple things. So oak trees are super important for a number of reasons. Um, for one, they support well over 500 um, butterfly and moth caterpillar or larvae 
And that's, that's much more than some other tree species such as maple. Um, so they're really important for that. And, and so all of that insect life really supports a lot of songbird communities. Um, so pictured here is cerulean warbler, which really relies on um, white oaks in particular for nesting and foraging during the breeding season. But the kind of most famous thing about oaks is the acorns that they produce, right? So they produce these really nutritious seeds, acorns, that support over 90 wildlife species in North America. Um, some of those are some really popular game species like turkeys, wood ducks, deer, also bears, and countless other species. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about acorns today. So one of the main things about acorn production that is crucial to my research and, and how, how oaks kind of shape the ecological, ecological communities they're in is that they have this synchronized acorn production, um, what we call masting cycles. So masting is another word for, for seed production. So I'll kind of be using those interchangeably. Um, so what this means is that basically oak trees, when they produce acorns, they have a large spatially synchronized production. So it's not just haphazard, you know, one tree will produce and another tree won't. A lot of trees produce a lot of acorns or few acorns in the same years. So this figure here is kind of showing this synchronization. We have on the y-axis the average percent of trees bearing acorns and then on the x-axis so 15 years of acorn surveys by the Ohio Division of Wildlife. And if we look at the red line, so this is showing red oak acorn abundance, and the dotted line is showing this sort of long-term average. You can kind of see that we have pretty haphazard acorn production here. So some years were well above average, some years are well below average, and there's really very few years that actually have an average amount of acorn production. So usually it's kind of fluctuating a lot, high production years, low production years, and same goes for the white oak acorns. And um, sometimes these, the white oaks and the red oaks, so those are two kind of distinct groups of oaks that I won't get into the details too much right now, but um, sometimes they kind of sync up in when they, in when they have their sort of abundance or, or low mast years. So for example, from 2009 here until 2015, they're kind of mirroring each other, having the same uh, cycles. But in other years, like more recently or at the left-hand side of this graph, they're kind of having opposite relationships. So it's kind of pretty haphazard and it's very hard to predict. But the important thing is that it's spatially synchronized over large areas, like several hundred miles. So that synchronized, those synchronized masting cycles um, really set off a whole cascade of effects on the populations that rely on acorns for food. Um, so this figure here is kind of showing some of, some of these um, interacting effects. So let's take a look here. On the left, we have mast failure. So we have a very low mast year. And then on the right, we have a very high mast year. And so the species that really rely on acorns, such as mice and deer, they're going to have, they're going to show population changes in response to the acorn abundance because they're feeding on that. So in a low mast year, for example, mice and deer have uh, their populations drop. And then that in turn sets off a cascade of other events. So the deer ticks or black legged ticks, which feed their initial large larval stage on mice. So the tick populations are also going to drop that year. And the following year, we'll see a drop in Lyme disease. However, um, a lower population of mice and other small mammals is going to be good for for some small songbird communities because some of the main predators of birds' nests and eggs are small mammals like mice. So in a low, uh, low mast year, low mouse year, that's actually gonna be good for songbirds and also gonna be good for gypsy moths, for example, because mice are one of the main predators of gypsy moth larvae. So we have these kind of interacting effects here because of the fluctuations in mast production. On the right, we kind of, see the opposite effects. So, you know, a really good mast year is gonna be good for mice, good for deer. Unfortunately, that's also good for ticks and then uh, Lyme disease in humans. And unfortunately, it's also bad for birds and moths. 
But of course, this is just a small sample of all the cascading effects that could happen from, um, from these acorn fluctuations. So for example, we might have, um, so gypsum, the, the effect of gypsy moths also sets off other potential feedback loops. So gypsy moths are, when they have a big outbreak, they can really defoliate um, trees, especially oak trees. And so that heavy defoliation of oak trees, while maybe not killing the tree, it can really set it back in terms of its ability to produce more acorn, acorns. So that can kind of lead to a feedback loop where the low acorn mass year, which is good for gypsy moths, is then actually bad again for the, for the oaks themselves because they're getting so heavily defoliated. Um, some other interacting effects we have are of course the higher trophic levels, so the predators. Um, so we have here a sharp shinned hawk or cooper's hawks that feed on uh, songbirds. So we might see population fluctuations with them. And then owls, for instance, which mainly rely on small mammals, we might see you know, further fluctuations in owl populations as a result of these masting cycles. So yeah, I just want to drive home that point that um, these fluctuating masting cycles are really important for driving population dynamics. In, in Appalachian forests in particular. So we've talked about why acorns are so great um, for, you know, for driving all of these, these ecological processes, but for the trees themselves, why would they produce acorns? So what does a tree get out of this? Um, so most animals, when they're eating acorns, like raccoons, bears, deer, when they're eating acorns, they're not helping dispersal or anything. They're just, they're killing the, the, the seeds. So they are acting as seed predators. Um, so it turns out the, the whole purpose of, for oaks to, to produce these acorns is really to target a few species. So in particular, things like squirrels. Um, so here, this is the Ice Age squirrel. If you've seen those movies, um, it kind of spends the whole movie chasing around acorns. So yeah, everybody knows that squirrels love acorns. And this is because the oaks are kind of targeting squirrels and a few other species for the seed dispersal mutualism. So what they're trying to do is have animals that cache seeds, um, they're trying to give them a, a kind of nice nutritious food so they'll have an incentive to cache that seed. So the way this works kind of just to really illustrate this here, um, we have a squirrel or some other animal that caches seeds, it kind of encounters it, if it decides to eat it, then it's just a seed predator and that's no good for the, for the tree. But um, during the fall, they often will decide to cache those seeds and they'll place them in the ground. And then if the squirrel either forgets where that cache is or if the squirrel dies, it's planted or it's cached all those seeds, essentially planting them. And then those seeds are then in a kind of good location to germinate and grow into trees. So that's the kind of mutualistic aspect of this here. Now, well, squirrels are probably the most famous animals to hoard and cache seeds. And, you know, every fall you probably see them around there kind of pushing on the ground, burying their little seeds. Um, in fact, blue jays, you know, a lot of, for a lot of oak trees are actually a more effective disperser for acorns than squirrels are. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why. Um, and in fact, so blue jays are so good at this that they are kind of really the only species or one of the only species that can explain the rapid expansion of oaks following the last ice age. So this figure here, it's not too important, but basically it's just showing from 12,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago, we're looking at the recession of the glaciers. So this hatched area is the glaciers and kind of showing how they recede. And then this other sort of dotted and checkered um, pieces here are showing the migration north of oaks in the top line, uh, beech, and then chestnuts at the bottom, um, and showing how this is in the fossil pollen record. So looking at um, soil cores and looking at fossilized pollen, we can kind of look at the migration rate of these trees. And for oaks and beech especially, some of their migration rates were up to 300 meters per year. So that's really fast for a tree, which you know, can't move. Um, and really the only species that can explain that rapid of a migration is blue jays. So there's a few reasons why. One, blue jays cache their nuts in the ground like squirrels do. 
But there are other animals that cache nuts in trees, for example, like woodpeckers um, and some red squirrels cache in trees. Um, blue jays also will cache thousands of nuts per year. So one individual can cache thousands of nuts. And then the, the most important thing is that blue jays, of course, have wings. So they can take these acorns a much longer distance than squirrels or small mammals. So they're really responsible for these long distance dispersals. Whereas squirrels might be really important for, for kind of localized dispersal within a patch, blue jays are really important for these long distance dispersals. And the other reason why blue jays are so good is that they are what we call scatter hoarders as opposed to larder hoarders. Um, so larder hoarding, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, is when, as the name kind of implies, when the animal just caches all of its, uh, all of its acorns in one kind of larder, one area. So that's, this photo here is kind of showing what that might look like. So like chipmunks do this, red squirrels do this. And so they don't really make very good dispersal agents for oak trees because they're not giving these acorns very many opportunities for germination and growth. Scatter hoarders, on the other hand, are doing what this figure is showing here. So when they take acorns from trees, they take them one or two or three at a time, and then they bring them to a different place every single time they make a trip. Um, so they, you know, blue jays in particular can transport these acorns across you know, long, large areas of unsuitable habitat, for, for example, farmland. They can bring them to new patches that are suitable. Um, they can even colonize new patches of, of, you know, for example, early successional area grasslands that don't yet have oak trees. So this scatter hoarding process means that blue jays and other scatter hoarders, for example, fox squirrel and gray squirrel are also scatter hoarders. Um, they're really responsible for dispersing over a large area, whereas some of these other animals that have larders are not really that helpful for oaks. Okay, so looking at what, so what my research is looking at is how this mutualism between blue jays, which I've kind of shown are one of the best dispersers for oaks and other kind of small seeded um, nuts like you know, chestnuts and, and acorns, um, how this mutualism between blue jays and nut bearing trees might shape the future of Appalachian forests. So there are two processes of forest change that I'm particularly interested in um, with this question. The first one is the ongoing decline of oak hickory forests. And the second is the imminent reintroduction of American chestnut. So I'm just going to briefly go over those before I get into my actual research. All right, so the decline of oaks, the main reason, there's a lot of interacting factors that are causing this, but, but basically we've been seeing over the last, you know, 40 or 50 years, we've been seeing a slow but steady decline in oak hickory forests, mainly because of um, human uh, fire suppression policies. So before 1900, fires were a relatively common um, part of the, the disturbance regime for Appalachian forests. So, you know, every few years, maybe every decade, there would be a fire, a forest fire, that would kind of burn through the forest and it wouldn't, you know, it would clean out the understory, but it wouldn't really destroy the forest. And oaks are fire adapted species. So this would actually be really good for oaks because it would clear out some of the um, some of the other species that might compete for light or resources. And so oaks were allowed to thrive in this um, kind of original environment. But with the kind of fire, the early fire suppression policies of the early 20th century, um, we kind of started to see a shift towards more shade tolerant or what we call mesophytic trees. So this whole process is called mesofication um, because it's the process of shade intolerant trees like oaks um, being replaced by shade tolerant or mesophytic trees like maples and beech. And so kind of what happens is as fire is suppressed, those understory shade tolerant trees are allowed to grow bigger and bigger. And so now when the oaks, which are the canopy trees, when they die out, they're gonna be replaced by um, shade tolerant trees like maple and beech. 
And so we're seeing this sort of steady decline in oak hickory um, canopies, even though they're, they're still important in the forest, they're gradually being replaced. So that's one process. The other is the um, reintroduction, uh, the imminent, it hasn't started yet, but the imminent reintroduction of American chestnut. So probably most of you have heard about American chestnut and it was once a, so here we have the range on the right. So kind of Eastern Ohio and most of the Appalachians. It was a really important kind of foundational tree species, which was, you know, a major canopy species that supported huge wildlife communities, but also um, human communities. So like Appalachian communities were really reliant on chestnut crops for, um, for, for income. And that was one of their main sort of economy in, in some small Appalachian towns. So of course, there, a, um, in the early 20th century, the introduced fungus, uh, chestnut blight, started killing adult or mature chestnuts. And within a few decades, you know, pretty much all of the mature chestnuts had died. So I think 4 billion trees or more had died. Um, chestnut does exist on the landscape still, but just as stump sprouts and saplings. And so once a chestnut gets old enough, it becomes infected with chestnut blight and dies. Um, so chestnuts now, even though they're still out there, you can find them occasionally as saplings. They don't usually reach uh, reproductive age before they are infected with the blight. So over the last few decades, there's been efforts uh, led by the American Chestnut Foundation and some others to try and develop strains of hybrid uh, blight resistant chestnuts that we might be able to reintroduce onto the landscape. And we're pretty close to having some blight resistant uh, trees that this process may start in the next five or 10 years. Okay, so I want to look at how blue jays are interacting with these two um, processes of forest change. There are two ways I'm doing this. First, I'm looking at kind of all the dynamics of scatter hoarding behavior. So looking at blue jay behavior, in particular seed preference and dispersal effectiveness, which I'll talk about. And then the other part is looking at blue jay populations and how they're influenced by those acorn masting cycles that I talked about earlier. So uh, the two ways I'm looking at this are through an overwinter survival study and then also looking at some long-term data sets. All right, so now finally I'm gonna get into my research here. So the first part, looking at seed selection or seed preference. And the big question here is I wanna know if blue jays will prefer or not prefer chestnuts over the other um, abundant available acorns that are already there on the landscape. Um, so the way I'm doing this, I've set up six platforms throughout, sorry, I didn't say my field site is in um, Southeast Ohio at Benton Furnace Experimental Forest. So that's Benton County. So we're in the Appalachian foothills for, for my research here. Um, so I have six platforms set up throughout the forest and Early season, so early in the fall, I bait these platforms with peanuts, which blue jays love, of course. And once the birds start coming to the platforms, I start seed selection trials where I place a, um, a tray with a certain number of seeds. And then I have three video cameras. So this kind of uh, photo here is showing the platform and I have these three cameras, a top one, angled one, and then a side one that monitor the platform so I can see what birds are doing when they come to the platform. And the three species of nuts that I'm offering are black oak acorns, white oak acorns, and then American chestnut seeds. Um, black oak and white oak are kind of the main, most abundant oak species at my site and across a lot of the central Appalachians. Um, in, particular, in particular, they're the seeds that are most preferred by blue jays. So there are, there are other trees like chestnut oak that are abundant but blue jays don't really like those very much because they're so big. So I'm comparing these three species and then I'm gonna show you a few videos of what this looks like. Um, so this is one angle of a, of a um, blue jay that's gonna be selecting some nuts. And so you can see how the tray is set up here. I have holes for each of the seeds and then uh, the different colors kind of represent the different seed species that I have. So black oak, white oak and chestnut. 
And I just want to kind of show you a few interaction or a few little behaviors here. So this blue jay already has a black oak acorn. And I think he's trying to figure out how to get a second one in his bill, but he hasn't really figured it out. Um, I did have a lot of young birds at my site, so they're relatively inexperienced. If you watch this bird, so I don't know if you saw that, but it, the first acorn it took, the first black oak acorn it took, it immediately put into its throat pouch, called a guler pouch. I'll play it one, oops, I'll play it one more time um, so you can kind of see that. So watch that second bird when it comes up. Um, this is something that if you watch blue jays enough, you'll see them do this a lot. They'll, they'll store food if it's small enough in this expandable throat pouch, and then they'll try and get more acorns that they can hold in the bill. And so I think that's what this first bird is trying to do, and it doesn't know how to do it, but the second bird does. So that he stores that one, takes another one, doesn't like it, and picks up another one and flies off with it. So this is some of the, I you know, got to watch hours of this video for my data analysis. Um, here's another one. Uh, I, did, I mainly want to show this video because it kind of is a little bit of proof that blue jays aren't always the biggest bullies at the feeders. I know blue jays kind of get a bad rap sometimes. Um, but red-bellied woodpeckers, which I had at my platform relatively often, can certainly hold their own against blue jays. Um, and here you'll, here you'll kind of see one just sort of scaring off all these other blue jays while it just wants to eat its acorn here. And you can tell that the blue jays are a little bit wary. They know that the woodpecker can be a bit aggressive towards them. And so they're kind of trying to stick to the end of the platform and not bother the woodpecker here. You see how it kind of went after that one a little bit. And all the blue jays are waiting around the edge, kind of hoping the woodpecker will leave. Um, okay, so one more video, I think, of this. So this is what this is an angle um, looking at the side of it. And although I can't see the the like uh, choice set of the platform, there is a reason that I want to have this side view, and that's that I want to be able to see the bird's legs. Um, so I was banding some birds, and so in order to kind of figure out which birds were visiting the platform and get individual uh, preferences, I needed to be able to see their, their unique color combination of bands. So you'll see a bird here um, that is banded and also has a transmitter, which I'll talk about later. So it's coming any second now. So you can see that transmitter coming off the back and then he has color bands on his leg and you know, it's red, red, blue on the left and green aluminum on the right. And so I would use those color bands to um, identify individuals. Um, this one here is not banded. So I, I did have a lot of birds that I was unable to band um, over the course of the study. Okay, so looking at some, uh, some early, Kind of simplified results here um, of 980, 983 selection events. So every time a bird, a blue jay, so this is just for blue jays, um, every time a blue jay took a seed, that was a selection event. Um, so they generally prefer black oaks and, over chestnuts and chestnuts over white oaks. So that's kind of the order of preference. Um, so chestnuts, you know, even though they have not been available on the landscape for a long time, they are still something that could be preferred by blue jays. Um, so that was kind of a cool find. Um, and so, I mean, my results will be a bit more nuanced than this, but this is sort of the main take home message here. And there are some things that might influence their preference. So seed size, uh, shell thickness. So Blue jays are kind of known to prefer smaller acorns because they're able to fit more in their throat pouch and their bill, so they can transport more acorns at once for smaller ones. So that's kind of, that's probably why we're seeing the highest selection for black oak acorns because they were the smallest acorns in our study or the smallest seeds. Um, shell thickness is another thing. So how hard it is to get into the meat of the acorn. Uh, chestnuts actually have pretty thin uh, easily penetrable shells. So that's something in favor of chestnuts in terms of their um, dispersibility. Familiar familiarity might 
might come into it um, a bit and also nutritional value. And then we're not really sure whether or not palatability, so how, you know, how tasty or how bitter the acorn is or potentially storability or perishability might come into it for blue jays. Um, but that's something that we're looking into. Okay, so I'll move on to the next part. Um, so the next part of the scatter hoarding behavior I'm looking at is their dispersal effectiveness. So the main questions here I wanna know are where and how far do blue jays cache seeds from the parent tree? And are these cache sites gonna be beneficial for the growth of the seedlings um, that are cached there? So the way I'm doing this, so I first need to find cache sites, which is quite difficult in a, in a contiguous forest like my field site. So we try that first, um, just following blue jays around and kind of trying to observe them taking an acorn from a tree, mark a waypoint at that tree with a GPS, and then following the blue jay through the forest until we see a cache. Um, but that was quite difficult to do. So what we had to do instead was actually track the nuts themselves. So for this, we basically take acorns and chestnuts, drill a small hole in seed. So this photo kind of shows a cross section of what that might look like. Drill a small hole in the seed and I have these really small radio transmitters that I would put in the seed and then kind of put some wood filler inside there to fill it up and make it look like a normal acorn again. And then I present those to the birds at the platform. And then when they would take those seeds from the platform, they had that radio transmitter, which is sending out a pulse signal that I could uh, use a antenna to home in on to locate the caches. So that's usually how I was um, finding blue jay caches of acorns um, at my study site. And then once I found all those caches, I would return with viable seeds. So obviously the, the seeds no longer very healthy or viable once I've drilled out a hole into it. So I return with, um, with good seeds, plant them at those cache sites, and then monitor the germination and growth of those seedlings. Um, so here are a couple more videos of what this looks like. Um, I have these two videos are kind of nice because they kind of show anecdotally the seed preferences that I talked about just a couple minutes ago. So we'll kind of watch this and I might play them twice so you can kind of really see what's going on here. All right, so this blue jay we have here, sorry, let me explain this first. So what I've done, I usually would present uh, nine acorns at once. So each of these ac or each of these seeds here have a radio transmitter inside and it'd be three seeds of each species, the black oak, white oak, and the chestnut. So at the beginning of this video, um, Already one of the uh, chestnuts, I believe, is gone, um, but we have a blue jay about to take a black oak acorn. So he's taking a black oak acorn. This next bird, he takes a black oak and he puts it into that throat pouch. He tries a white oak, doesn't really like that one, so he doesn't take it. And then he takes a chestnut. So he flew off with a chestnut and then a, a black oak acorn in that uh, throat pouch. And in the next, whoops, the next video, this kind of picks up just a couple minutes later. So we have the bird take, takes the last black oak acorn, the one that just flew off. That other one had a white oak acorn, but he didn't really like it very much. So right now there's three white oaks and one chestnut. So that bird just took the last chestnut. And then this bird here takes a white oak acorn and decides to eat it right in the platform. So if you've never seen um, how, how blue jays or other birds eat acorns, they don't swallow them whole. They you know, hammer into it until they can get at that um, kind of good meat that's inside of the acorn called the cotyledons. Um, I'll play this one one more time just so you can watch this. So here he takes that last chestnut. And then this guy starts hammering into the white oak acorn.
So those two videos kind of show that they cleared out the black oak acorns first, then they moved on to the chestnuts. And then lastly, they moved on to white oak acorns. So that's kind of a nice little um, sort of micro observation of the, the seed selection trials that we had. Okay, so once they've taken those um, acorns off the platform, I need to then find those individual seeds. And so I get out my antenna and uh, receiver, and then I'm, I'm able to home in on that signal of that seed until I find it in the ground like this chestnut here. So it's usually buried under some leaves and pushed into that um, kind of duff layer just above the soil. That's how most of the caches are. And then once I find the caches, I return with those viable seeds and I plant one seed of each species inside a cage. So the cage there is to try and exclude predators so I can actually watch the germination and growth of the seedling because um, you know a lot of small mammals might take these seeds. But I also plant three seeds outside the cage because I do want to know how likely those seeds are to be taken by other animals. Um, so kind of estimate the predation or the porphyrage rate. So for those seeds that are inside the cage though, once they germinate and grow, I turn um, over the course of the spring and the summer, measure the growth of the seedlings. And then I also um, measure a lot of habitat and vegetation variables. For example, this is a photo of the canopy. Um, so I'm trying to get an idea of the, the light that's available to that seedling there. Okay, so just I'm just going to show a couple of results from this. I'm still in the middle of doing all the analyses for this um, project, so I don't have uh, too much detail, but I can show some of the results here. Um, first on the left, this is showing the kind of habitat preferences for cache sites of blue jays. So what we have here on the left bar is the habitat, the proportion of caches that were in these different habitats. So early successional habitat, mature forest, mid-successional and grassland. And then on the right represents the available habitats or the random sites. So every, every time I had a cache, I would then also pair it with a random site to kind of get an uh, idea of the availability of habitat. So what this is kind of showing is that blue jays preferred to cache an early successional habitat um, more than it was available. So that's showing preference for that habitat. And they did not prefer mature forest. So mature forest was kind of widely available, but they didn't really like the passion that as much. And then on the right here, this is showing a histogram of the dispersal distances of the seeds that I tracked. So we have on the x-axis, the dispersal distance from those platforms that I had, and then the y-axis is showing the number of caches at each distance. So basically what we see is that most of the caches were within 100 or 150 meters, but we did have some caches that were longer over you know, 300 and 400 meters. So, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, blue jays can cache, they're really important for long distance dispersal, um, in other studies, depending on the landscape, you might see cache distances up to four or five kilometers, so thousands of meters. Um, usually, blue jays will only cache at that great a distance if it's really fragmented habitat, if they need to transport the seeds over a large um, area of unsuitable habitat like farmland. Um, but in a contiguous forest like this, there's not really any need to transport seeds that far. So we're seeing shorter dispersal distances, but still we're seeing a lot of distances that are further than a lot of squirrels might take seeds, for example. Of my time. Okay, we're looking good. All right, so the last part of my study was looking at the overwinter survival and its link to those um, fluctuating mast cycles. So the main questions here I want to know is winter survival of blue jays dependent on acorn abundance. So we know that for animals like mice or um, you know, maybe some deer, that their populations and their survival kind of depend a bit on how many acorns are available, but we don't really know that yet for blue jays. Um, and I also wanna know what else might drive blue jay population fluctuation, fluctuations. 
So um, the first way we did this was looking at a, um, we did a local survival study. So we were tagging birds, as I mentioned before, with color bands and also those radio, um, those radio tags on their back. And the way that we captured birds was either by mist net or by baited potter traps. So on the bottom photo here, this is showing um, an example of a potter trap where we bait it with peanuts. The bird would walk into the trap and then the door would close down behind it. So then we would go and get it out of the trap. But blue jays are pretty smart. So usually once I caught a bird at one location in a trap, um, I didn't have much success catching more birds in traps. So I, I actually had to do a lot of mist netting. Even though blue jays love peanuts, they are pretty smart about learning not to go into those traps. Um, but once I captured them, I sort of banded them. I put these nano tags, which I'll show a picture of, um, and then use automated telemetry to kind of track their survival. And then the other part of the study, which I might get to, is the kind of broad scale population analysis. So automated telemetry um, is how we kind of track their survival. So this kind of saved us from having to go out all the time and track the birds by hand. So instead of doing that, and that would that's a lot of effort because they're spread out in a really hilly landscape, um, I set up two automated telemetry towers. And so this photo is showing what those look like. And basically these are constantly monitoring the radio frequency of the tags that we put on the birds uh, so that, you know, 24 seven, they're always monitoring. So we can detect movement of all those birds without actually having to go out by hand um, and locate every bird. So we would con confirm the survival of every bird at least every two weeks, usually every week from December 1st, to April 1st, that was our winter period. And um, I do wanna mention, being up in Toledo, you may have heard of the MODIS wildlife tracking system. Um, so if you're not familiar, this is basically a, a joint effort among you know, hundreds of scientists, uh, but first organized by Bird Studies Canada um, of people setting up these automated telemetry towers, just like what I just showed you. And it allows researchers to track small birds and bats across the whole continent as they migrate um, without having to have GPS tags on them. So a lot of the GPS technology is not quite there to have GPS tags for small birds, but we can have small um, radio transmitters, which is what I used, and it, which is what we use with this MODIS wildlife tracking system. So this, fig, this map is kind of showing where all the towers are right now in the MODIS tracking system. So here down in South Ohio, are my two towers. Um, so I'm not really using this huge tracking system for my study since it's a local survival study and I probably didn't have too many migrants. Um, but theoretically, if my birds were migrants from Ontario, for example, they might get detected on this array um, as they kind of migrated back north. And so my towers are part of this tracking system. Um, and I can talk more about that in the questions if you have questions about that. Uh, so just a couple of brief um, results from this survival study. I tracked 86 birds over the three years, uh, 39 adults and 47 young or first year birds. I had quite a few mortalities. I had 24 mortalities, but you can see that most of those are young birds. So the adults were much better at avoiding predation. They're probably a lot more cautious. They've learned how to avoid predators um, and be a bit more secretive. So yeah, young are really hit hard by probably mostly exhibitors like a sharp chin hawk. I also had 12 departures. So this is birds that left midwinter. Um, again, this was mostly young birds. And so these are probably birds that didn't have as much experience. They may not have um, kind of known how to cache as well. And so maybe in the middle of the winter, their food supply was low. And so they decided to leave the site. Um, I think I have enough time to talk about this. So, so I'll look, talk a little bit about the other part of this um, study, the long-term population data sets. So basically the idea here is to use long-term data sets of both 
uh, blue jay populations and acorn fluctuations, so those masting cycles that I talked about, and try and compare those to see if, if the blue jay populations are mirroring um, or impacted at all by those acorn fluctuations. So I'm using the breeding bird survey data set, which is from uh, as old as 1966, and the Christmas bird count, um, which may, maybe some of you have taken part in, which is started in 1900. And then I'm comparing those to uh, state wildlife acorn abundance surveys. So a lot of states in the, in the eastern U.S. have these acorn abundance um, surveys that they do, but it's very variable effort. So, uh, you know, Ohio does it one way and maybe West Virginia does it another way. So it's kind of a difficult thing to work with, but I'm trying to basically collect as many of these data sets, these kind of state level data sets as possible. Um, and I've been able to do it for 14 states, mostly in the Appalachian region. And a lot of them don't go far as far back as the, the bird survey data does. So I probably will only be able to use about 20 years or more or so of, um, of the acorn abundance data. But basically, yeah, the idea is to kind of try and match up these data sets to see if blue jays are impacted by acorn abundance. And there's also, of course, other factors that will play into blue jay population dynamics. So um, one, there could be timelines in response to mast. So, you know, if they're influenced more by predators than by the actual acorn abundance, then maybe we're looking at how predators are influenced by acorn abundance mediated through mouse or small mammal abundance. So it might be like a two or three year uh, time lag in, in how blue jays respond to acorn abundance. Um, we also, of course, weather is gonna be an important thing. So snow cover and how cold the winters are, the population of competition like mice and woodpeckers, and then potentially migration. Um, so blue jays, you know, we don't know that much about blue jay migration, um, so up there at the lake, you probably see some big flocks of blue jays flying over occasionally. Um, but we don't really know that much about when or why blue jays migrate. So we know that sometimes birds migrate and sometimes they don't. Um, some years we have a lot more migrants than others. So that's something that is certainly something I saw at my field site. So over the three years of my study, you know, the second year had very low numbers of blue jays. And almost all of the birds I was catching were adults, probably residents. Whereas the first year and the third year, I had a lot of young birds, a lot more blue jays in general. So I think we had a big influx of young migrants. Um, so it's something I'm going to try to address with when I do these analyses, but we don't really know that much about blue jay migration right now. And finally, I want to bring all of this together. So all those um, scatter hoarding and seed dispersal dynamics we talked about and blue jay population fluctuations and try and figure out what the implications are for the future of Appalachian forests. So first, um, in terms of oak management, I wanna know if these, if blue jays are affected by acorn abundance, you know, that might lead to a feedback loop where lower acorn abundance or lower oaks, a decline in oaks means a decline in blue jay populations, which also means, um, fewer opportunities for acorn dispersal. So we might see a slowing down of oak dispersal and acorn dispersal because of declining blue jay populations. Um, so that's one potential. And then also we wanna see if maybe we can prioritize areas for active oak management um, to kind of sort of uh, optimize, you know, the dispersal potential of acorns based on where blue jays are. And so likewise for chestnut restoration, um, we wanna see if we can optimize the founder plantings for to kind of maximize that dispersal potential again. So basically that means trying to determine what the best sites are to plant original founder chestnut trees and try and maximize areas where blue jays are gonna be most abundant to have the, the best dispersal potential and then also try and improve tree colonization models given the interactions that we've seen with jays and the existing oaks on the landscape. So this figure here on the right is just showing a couple of examples of these tree colonization models under um, two different sort of restoration plans. So I'm hoping to 
provide, provide some more information into these tree colonization models for chestnut. Okay, um, so finally, I just want to thank some people. So Matt Schumar and Molly McDermott uh, had a private property down at Vint Furnace that I used for some of my research as well. Um, Bill Barovica is the manager of, of my main field site, Vint Furnace, the Forest Service. Uh, my other committee members, Matt, Dr. Matt Davis and Libby Marshall. Um, some funding from the College of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State. And my three field technicians over the three years, John Buffington, Holly Tadero, and Devin Hendricks did a lot of hard work to collect this data. And then finally with the American Chestnut Foundation in particular helped um, with especially getting all those American chestnut seeds that I had to use. Um, so I wanna thank Sarah Fitzsimmons and Jim McKenna. And I also had some funding from some other organizations, the Animal Behavior Society, Kirtland Bird Club, um, the Chestnut Foundation also funded some of this. So thank you to all of those people. And with that, I think I'm done and I'll take questions now. Um, so I guess I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. Yeah, there are several questions in the chat window. Okay. All right, so first we have, where do you get the chestnuts and will they be dispersed and grow? Um, all right, so I got the chestnuts from, from the American Chestnut Foundation, as I mentioned at the end there. Uh, I, I did have to get them from different sources each year. Uh, so one year I got them from orchards in Pennsylvania. One year I got them mostly from an orchard in Indiana, um, outside of Purdue University. And then the last year I got most of my chestnuts from a orchard in West Virginia, just over the border, um, just over the Ohio River. Um, and all of those were kind of coordinated through the American Chestnut Foundation. And I think I already talked about how they, they'll be dispersed and they, they certainly do grow. Like chestnuts grew really well. Um, actually, they grew faster and more of them, more of them germinated and grew into seedlings than the acorns. So they were quite successful in those cache sites. Um, yeah. So did any jays eat transmitters? Um, that's, yeah, that's something that some people are concerned about. So the way that the birds eat the acorns and chestnuts doesn't allow them really to eat the transmitter. Since they're not swallowing the acorn whole, they're just pecking it through the shell until they get to the meat. Basically, once they got to the transmitter, they immediately know it's not food. So they, um, they just discard it and drop it. So I would often, if the, if the bird decided to eat the acorn instead of cash it, which happened, you know, at least half of the time, I would just find the acorn by its, or I'm sorry, I would just find the transmitter by itself on the ground. So no, I don't think the birds ever ate the transmitters. Um, how do you treat data collected during a year of abnormal species mortality? Like 2021 has been with high blue jay mortality. So, so, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm really interested in basically, right? So how, how are those, mortal, how does the mortality change year by year? And I don't think I mentioned, but sort of one of the point of doing this study over three years was to have a natural variation in acorn abundance. Um, so, you know, we wanna see if acorn abundance is affecting any of these blue jay mortality numbers, but of course, other things could be affecting that. So, you know, um, the winter temperatures could easily have a bigger impact on, on mortality than acorn abundance. And so basically the way that I'll do the analysis, I'll include those other variables and see which most strongly explains uh, survival or mortality. So that's kind of how I'll, I'll be trying to incorporate as many variables as possible that impact blue jay mortality to look at that and how that fluctuates. Um, so we have a question here, what influences mast cycles and are they predictable? Um, so that's a really good question. And I will just briefly, I have a slide for that um, that I'll show here. So yeah, mast cycles, it's really, it's still not very well understood uh, what influences or 
what causes these mass cycles. Um, so on the left here, some of the some of the potential reasons of how it happens are resource dynamics, so nutrients in the soil, um, pollination dynamics, so looking at um, basically good or bad conditions for pollination. And, but probably the biggest things have to do with hormones and weather cues and, and environmental variation. So uh, some recent research has kind of found that probably what happens is that since some of these things like resource dynamics and pollination vary on a smaller scale than the synchronization happens, those probably aren't as responsible for masking, but weather cues happen at a very large scale. So we're looking at like dry springs or like the first frost or the you know last frost date or something like that. So probably what happens is these, there's certain weather cues. Um, for instance, one weather cue that's come up a couple times is like dry, uh, dry spring weather. So that's when, when the oaks are flowering. Um, if it's really good conditions for flowering and pollen dispersal, so we have dry, the dry conditions with quite a bit of wind. Um, so that's kind of a weather cue that they might use to produce a big bloom. And then, so the cue sort of set, sets off the hormonal levels to produce a big bloom. Um, and that's going to then result in a big acorn crop. Uh, so, but yeah, it's actually still not very well understood how these trees can really synchronize over such a large scale, but that's some ideas. Um, while I have this slide, I'll just kind of address some of the potential options of why this might happen. Um, so as I mentioned, pollination. So pollination efficiency is one really kind of good uh, explanation of why they might want to do this mass thing. So if you have all the trees pollinating at once, that increases the opportunities for cross-pollination. Um, rather than just, you know, trees haphazardly pollinating on their own. And then, uh, you know, predator, what we have is a thing called the predator satiation hypothesis, which basically is that if you swamp all the seed predators with an overabundance of acorns, that's going to encourage more caching than those animals really need. And so they're going to overcache, and they're going to cache more than they need. So uh, that will basically mean that more more nuts, more seeds will escape predation and have the opportunity to germinate and grow. That's kind of the simplified version of that. So that was a good question. Um, let's see, we have, when do they think that the chestnut will be reintroduced? Um, so right now, the, the most recent uh, development with the American chestnut is they have, they've been working on a transgenic American chestnut. So that's basically you inserting a, a gene to pure American chestnuts to provide blight, uh, blight resistance. And it's a, it's a perfectly healthy, um, sort of not weird gene. It's from other plants. It's in many plants. Um, the specific one that they got is from the wheat plant. Um, but basically it just imparts a uh, resistance to, to the blight. And it's, this is currently in the process of getting um, approved through all the federal regulatory uh, agencies that need to approve this kind of thing. So it's in the middle of like USDA approval right now. Um, but there's also the hybrid chestnuts, which are like 94% American chestnut, um, which are also have some blight resistance, but not quite as much as they were hoping. Um, but the, the kind of... Uh, Estimates are maybe maybe within five or ten years we might start to see some some founder plantings going out there, but I think that's that's been pushed back a lot over the years. So I'm, I don't really think I can say for sure what what when that's going to be. Okay, that looks like the last. Happened, right? That's the last question, I think. Right. Looks like it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Jay. That was really interesting, and um, good luck with the rest of your data analysis. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a lot ahead of me, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Um, and um, I just before we close the meeting, I just want to remind everybody that our next program is November 18th, Thursday at 7 p.m. And that's going to feature Brian Zwiebel talking about shorebird behavior and, of course, sharing his beautiful photography, too. So I know a lot of you are going to want to join us for that. 
So watch for the registration link and um, we will see you all on November 18th. And thanks to everyone for being here. Good night. Thank you.